Today was a red letter day for renewable energy reports. The International Energy Agency released its uh, Renewables 2025 analysis and forecast of 2030, and Ember Energy uh, released Global Electricity Review mid Mid-Year Insights 2025. I'm going to talk to Raul Miranda, who is the Ember Energy's Global Programming Director. So welcome to the interview, Raul. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Uh, maybe what we should do to start is, what do we mean by renewable energies? Are we talking about just wind and solar? Is it wind and solar and batteries? Uh, do we include hydro and nuclear and geothermal in there? Uh, well, generally, uh, when we are um, um, talking about renewables, and at least in this very last report, we've been uh, um, putting our focus on solar and wind, uh, which means um, solar and wind, I mean, the core a key message there is that solar and wind have been um, outpacing uh, coal generation globally. Uh, but having said that, renewables generally uh, have also uh, been... Uh, um, increasing and being growing in importance across the globe as well but just that uh, for these uh, other renewables of course that that also changes uh, depending on where you go and depending on some more specific local uh, um, um, factors um what's driving the rapid adoption of renewables i mean we've we've looked at the cost curves over the last 10 15 years and how dramatically uh, costs have come down. Is that the leading cause, or are and are and is there other causes that we should be thinking about? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the short answer is, is uh, precisely technology, cost, and the momentum. Uh, solar and wind have become the cheapest forms of new power in most parts of the world. The uh, um, and typically, you've we've seen you know a, a huge decrease in the past two decades for these uh, technology technologies, and that's uh, naturally a result of uh, investment and 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 incentives as well back then, uh, for a long time. Uh, at the same time, they are fast to build. So uh, what once took years uh, um, with uh, coal and gas uh, can all be done in months, especially when we are talking about solar. So that's also. Um, a, 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 a huge improvement, especially when we are uh, when we are uh, uh, trying to keep up with the uh, increasing and very important growth in electricity. Um, at the same time, every uh, new project uh, um, uh, for solar and wind sort of makes the next one cheaper as well, uh, creating as well an interest interesting cycle of growth. Uh, while at the same time, for fossil fuels that uh, typically goes on the other direction. The more you have, the, uh, the tendency is that you have it more expensive just because uh, the marginal uh, extraction cost for fossil fuels, it's, it's, uh, it's increasing. So you have essentially these two, these two um, technologies going in the opposite direction in terms of uh, technologies uh, and cost trend, in terms of cost. And at the same time, you already have um, solar generation being cheaper than just uh, operating existing uh, coal uh, generation, for instance. My observation, Raul, and I'd be interested to get your take on it. My observation is there are two sort of main drivers of why people adopt uh, renewables. One is uh, very strong policy support. You see that in China, you've seen it in Europe in, in the past. And the other is the instability of existing power grids. We see that in Pakistan, for, for example. Uh, we see the uh, problems with power grids, creaky old power grids in the United States, where, where they've underinvested uh, for years and years. And solar is just the fastest thing they can get to, uh, to meet growing demand. Is, is that fair to say that, that policy and uh, grid problems uh, are a big contributor to how fast renewables are growing? Um, it depends again where you go. I think in 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 regions like the U.S. and and Europe generally, as you have, uh, um, uh, you know, these grids uh, being built for decades already, and uh, you eventually have um, a growing need or requirement for essentially um, um, improving these grids and creating new lines. I mean, a good example is uh, as you alluded to, 
is uh, those uh, um, low queues that you eventually see uh, across the U.S. It's it's not. The, I mean, the investors are there willing to, you know, deploy those uh, solar and wind facilities. It's just that you cannot, uh, you don't have uh, in feed capacity from specific grid uh, points to to deploy those facilities. But that's not the same story uh, depending on where you go. Uh, um, um, in some in some other uh, regions, uh, you essentially you are uh, as we speak, you are building new, these new uh, grid lines uh, and and the infrastructure generally are from scratch. But again, it depends also on where you go. Again, I mean, uh, if we are talking about um, you know a small scale, perhaps an island, that's absolutely different than a country as big as you know the U.S. or China. Um, and all these countries, at some point in time, they eventually, uh, you know, struggled with uh, grid connections and having congestions. But uh, we do see uh, um, the ways and the technologies are available to just outcome those challenges. Uh, and we've seen, again, you know, successful experiences and, and cases in, in China, in Brazil, in some other countries, also across Europe, and how to uh, uh, overcome some of these bottlenecks. There seems to be with renewables and solar in particular, a very a unique case here that we haven't seen before, and that's distributed energy. Because it wasn't like you could build a hydro dam or a coal plant in your backyard, but now you can put solar panels on your roof. And, uh, and the one that excites me the most is uh, industry and, and commercial businesses uh, because they need dependable power. Their business depends on it. And so they're self-generating. You know, it's a case of uh, solar panels and batteries and uh, digital controls. And it, how important is, uh, is uh, distributed energy resources uh, to the growth of renewables uh, going forward? Um, typically, I'm, I mean, distributed generation is generally easier to, uh, as you alluded to again, it's just easier to just, you know, put a, a solar panel on your rooftop and you're not, uh, you're not uh, uh, competing for land, right? Why uh, uh, perhaps if you are to, uh, if you were to um, build up a utility scale of uh, even solar plant, but if we go to wind farms, that might be even more complex. You'd need some amount of land, right? At the same time, typically, this distributed energy resource that they tend to, so your um, break-even price tends to be more at the end use level, which tends to be a higher price. While uh, um, at the when you have utility scale, you're essentially uh, you know competing in the wholesale market. So these are also two different price levels that uh, tend to, uh, uh, at least at, for, at the first moment, tend to facilitate the integration of. Uh, of um, of uh, distributed energy resources, and if we go back, uh, you know, ten years ago, maybe even more, fifteen years ago, we did have, you know, some of these uh, very uh, important incentives. So things like feeding tariffs in Germany, feeding tariffs as, as well in uh, in China, uh, um, and did really uh, give you know a great incentive for having you know uh, industries or even households. Uh, uh, installed in some of these uh, um, 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 facilities there as well as net metering so uh, again essentially the ability of um, uh, balancing any as far as electricity that you send to the grid electricity you consume from the grid and having at the end of the day or at the end of the month actually in your build that balance between these two and you would essentially uh, you know pay only for uh, even either the surplus or the lack of electricity that you had uh, compared to what you uh, have generated so there are many, uh, the, the cases are different and generally they're, they're just simpler uh, to, uh, for towards the distributing generation. Uh, so uh, that's uh, one of the reasons uh, why this has been more, uh, you know, you have countries that, uh, that do see uh, most of the, especially solar, I think that's, that's quite important to make a point here. It's, it's more about solar. You do have wind uh, generation as well in terms of, you know, small, in even on rooftops, but that's, a, you know, a, a, you really have it spread for solar. And in this case, it's really, you see that there are many countries that do have, you know, like two thirds of place of uh, uh, solar generation actually on rooftops uh, uh, rather than on uh, utility scale facilities. The, uh, there's been a, a redefinition of energy security, and particularly we find this in Asia, 
where China and some of the other countries like uh, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, and so on, uh, they are they see renewables as a way to scale up and electrify their economies and reduce their imports of oil and gas. And I know a lot of countries, ex, uh, you know, hydrocarbon exporting countries like Canada are depending on those countries for growth. But it seems like they're headed in the opposite direction. They want to electrify. And it's a combination of wind, solar and coal in some cases, uh, at least for the time being, till they can scale up. What's, what's your take on that? Um, so if you if you just take um, uh, well naturally uh, we are moving to an electrified world so essentially that electrified different end users the obvious uh, example for that would be EVs but you can go to heat pumps you can go to low temperature heat and many other uses and um, and um, naturally that makes more than makes sense when you go with a renewable grid that that's a, a bit straightforward but still if you still had um, and, we, and and there are many assessments on that. If you still had, you know, a, a, a not clean grid, that's still better for EVs at least. For instance, just making a corporation for EVs specifically, that's still better than just having IC vehicles in terms of emissions, in terms of life cycle emissions. So still, um, uh, we do see that uh, uh, probably in many of these countries, it would have been better if the... Uh, um, you know the transition of the power grid would be uh, would have been faster, but still it's it's better that we uh, that we uh, in parallel we uh, continue and we progress towards electrification than just waiting for the grid uh, um, to be uh, you know up there and then just then you know continue for electrification. Uh, it's important to say that that's also changes for the different uh, you know end users, uh, but still I think the EVs example that's a good one. Uh, uh, which um, uh, not having a 100% clean grid, it's not. It should not be a reason for uh, uh, preventing uh, uh, going towards you know electrification broadly. Uh, let's talk about some of the numbers uh, that we've seen. You know, growth in renewables in the last little while. The IEA report says that we're expecting uh, solar PV will provide 80% of the growth in uh, renewables and wind would be, ne uh, would be the next biggest. And we're looking at anywhere from 2.6% growth to 2.8% 2.8 times by, by 2030. That's an incredibly rapid rollout of uh, particularly solar, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And that's what, what, what we've been also observing in our uh, this recent report we just shot, we just released. Uh, uh, solar reached uh, another record high uh, in you know, the fastest growing generation technology um, across the globe. Uh, in the first half of the year, so in the first half of 2025, uh, solar met roughly 80% uh, of the new electricity demand. Uh, so fossil growth now is no longer needed to cope with this increase in demand. And that's actually renewable. Uh, uh, it means that renewables can consistently have increasing shares of global generation. I think most importantly, that's also a trend we see um, across the, glo the globe. So that's not only include, you know, some specific country here and there, but that's something that we've seen really broadly, you know, uh, across Asia, Latin America, Africa as well. Uh, uh, so that's really a global trend that it's here to stay. Um, let's talk about um, what's going to happen over the next uh, little while. Or, and who's leading this? It's It seems pretty clear that China has uh, grown its renewables manufacturing capacity and driven down uh, prices. Are we going to see cheaper and cheaper and cheaper prices out of China or if prices kind of bottomed out, they can't go any lower. We do set, we still see have some room to go further. Uh, as I as I, I mentioned before, I mean uh, the interesting thing with uh, solar and wind, especially solar, actually, is that I mean the more you do, the more you you have a potential to continue in the increasing. Naturally, at some point there is a bottom line for this, but there is still room. And China uh, uh, has been definitely the core. Uh, um, um, engine of this, you know, transition of this movement. We've seen that, uh, and not only about solar, actually about uh, clean techs broadly. We've seen that, uh, you know, uh, talking about solar, EV, heat pumps, even grids, 
solar has been really uh, the core uh, uh, driver for this transition across the globe. But, and a way of doing that and then trying to see how the transition of this clean text has been uh, unfolding in different countries is essentially trying to uh, you know, see what are the exports of China on these clean talks to these to clean text to these countries. Recently, we we uh, we've released a very interesting uh, 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 um, work on Africa that, that we were essentially, you know, uh, seeing the exports of solar PV for two different ex African countries, and we could see by this that uh, uh, we could just see the movement and the transition and how these different countries across Africa and also, you know, making the link with the policies across that continent uh, is really moving at the transition there. And it, we really see new uh, and, and, and similar trends, you know, for different countries as well. Um, let's wrap up the interview with this question, uh, Raul. And it looks like by 2030, the IEA is forecasting that uh, wind and solar will be 28% of global generation and total renewables, so throwing in uh, hydro and geothermal and, and nuclear, uh, will be raise, raises that total to 43%. It sounds like, you know, we're, uh, the, the global economy is well on its way to being mostly renewables long before 2040. Yeah, that, that's correct. Again, that's uh, I think the main driver here is, is solar and wind, uh, uh, first solar, then wind. Uh, for the other renewables, uh, it really depends on where you go and where you have these resources. Um, as we move forward, uh, um, there might be some impact due to climate change in some of these uh, profiles, particular uh, hydro has been suffering a bit with this in some particular regions, but that's also uh, really make the case that diversification between renewables are really important. Uh, a point on that is that if you go to countries like Brazil, you do see that a very interesting, uh, you know, seasonal profile between these uh, these resources. When you have, you know, uh, um, uh, the, the so-called dry season for hydro, it's where the wind is uh, most blowing, uh, you know, uh, and so um, and then solar as well. So. Um, and similarly, when you go to biomass crops as well, you also have, you know, the different seasons and you have, and at some point you have all these different renewable resources coming up together and really making a good, uh, um, uh, um, you know, a good profile in terms of renewables across uh, that continent, across that region in terms of providing flat electricity generation across the years. So that's a quite an interesting point uh, to make. Raul, thank you very much for this. Thank you very much.